What's up guys, my name's Brandon and welcome back to Apple Weekly. In this episode, we're going to discuss Apple's master AI plan, why Apple has apologized for their new iPad ad, more new changes in iOS 17.5 before the final release, Apple's new application coming soon, a crazy AirTag story, and more. Okay, so before we talk about iOS 17.5 and what you need to know before the final release next week, let's talk about Apple's master plan for their new AI strategy. So earlier, this week, we saw the Wall Street Journal report that Apple is working on AI chips for data centers, but they didn't really elaborate too much on the details. But later on in the week, we saw Mark Gurman at Bloomberg report some additional details about what Apple has planned. So he says that Apple will deliver some of its upcoming iOS 18 AI features via AI data centers equipped with its own in-house processors. Apple is currently using the M2 Ultra chip to process advanced AI tasks in the cloud, and future versions will be based on the M4 chip, presumably the M4 Ultra. And he does clarify that the more simple AI-related features will be processed directly on device. So he says, relatively simple AI tasks, like providing users a summary of their missed iPhone notifications or incoming text messages, could be handled by the chips inside of Apple devices. More complicated jobs, such as generating images or summarizing lengthy news articles and creating long-form responses in emails, would likely require the cloud-based approach, as would an upgraded version of Apple's Siri voice assistant. And this right here is where I think Apple is going to be able to differentiate themselves in this whole AI race. Everybody on planet Earth, every company is trying to get in and cash in on this AI craze, but I think Apple is going to have a huge advantage because of their own silicon. Like we've seen what the M1 chip did to every other processor out there, they're going to do the same with these data centers that are run using their own silicon. So it will be very interesting to see where it goes from here and if Apple does use the M4 Ultra chip as early as this year, if it does actually get announced at the end of the year like we're expecting. So this is interesting and I just think it's part of Apple's master plan when it comes to their AI strategy. We also just got more details on Apple's AI strategy surrounding Siri. So this comes from a fresh New York Times report that outlines how Apple is going to be revamping Siri in iOS 18. They said this, Apple is expected to show off its AI work at WWDC when it releases an improved Siri that is more conversational and versatile. Siri's underlying technology will include a new generative AI system that will allow it to chat rather than respond to questions one at a time. And they also throw in a tidbit about the iPhone's 16, saying that Apple is also increasing the memory in this year's iPhones to support its new Siri capabilities. And Apple has also discussed licensing complementary AI models that power chatbots from several companies, including Google, Cohere, and OpenAI. Man, WWDC cannot come soon enough. Now, we also saw this week that Apple has plans to launch a new pro video application called Final Cut Camera. So they showed off a new version of Final Cut Pro at their Let Loose event on Tuesday. And in addition to that new version of Final Cut Pro, they showed off Final Cut Camera, which is a standalone application that's going to allow you to capture professional level footage with powerful manual controls, including ISO, shutter speed, white balance, zebras, focus peaking, and more. And it's also a required application if you want to use some of the new features in Final Cut Pro 2, like live multicam. Now, the application is surprisingly available for the iPhone 10s and later, and it's also going to be a free download later this spring, and it's not going to require a subscription to Final Cut Pro, which is great news. Now, we've already seen applications like the Blackmagic camera do this, but it's going to be interesting to see Apple roll out their own standalone pro video application. And I think Apple making this a standalone application as opposed to throwing this into the iPhone 16 Pro or into iOS 18, for example, is a good move because can you imagine how many, you know, moms and dads out there are going to accidentally go into that menu, into the pro menu and the camera application and wonder, you know, how to, how to get out of it and why their photos look so dark and grainy. Yeah. So I think it's a good move for Apple to have this as a standalone application. It's going to be really interesting to see how it stacks up to Blackmagic Camera, which I personally personally used a lot and it is a great application. So Apple will really need to make this better than that app if they want a lot of people to gravitate towards it. But of course, it probably will be the go-to application if you are using Final Cut Pro on the 
iPad. Okay, so before we talk about the controversy surrounding the new iPads, let's talk about iOS 17.5 because just this week we got the RC or release candidate version of 17.5 before the final release, which is coming next week. Now, there are a couple of changes that we saw in the RC. As you can see here, my wallpaper is the new Pride wallpaper. So this was included as part of the update. And I really like this because it changes your home screen every single time you go from the lock screen to the home screen. It kind of changes the orientation, pun intended for you know the pride text that goes across the home screen so it's really cool you can access this by tapping and holding on your lock screen and going to the plus down here and then scroll down until you get to the pride section you can see you have different designs here so we'll just go to this purple one and you can see the different styles that you have for each one of those it's pretty neat and it'd be really cool if apple made it so you can you know type out whatever text you want and it has these same type of animations because i really like this and then also in the rc we saw confirmation that the cross platform tracking detection feature is in iOS 17.5. This is part of Google and Apple's partnership to bring unknown AirTag tracking to all third-party trackers and not just the AirTag. And it also shows on both Android and on iPhone, no matter what tracker is being used to potentially stalk you. And then we also got clarity on the whole offline mode for Apple News Plus. So if you go into the news application and then go to like the News Plus section right here, you can see that we do have have downloaded so for whatever reason I've not been able to get any of my articles downloaded but basically let me show you what this is before I get into this so if I go to airplane mode here you can see that up top it now says set up offline mode because we have no internet connection and if you tap on that it will say you know this little pop up here and if you go to settings it will take you into the settings here and we have this section called news plus offline mode and you can turn on automatic downloads that is on by default and if you go into the download options all of these are selected by default but you can change them if you would want to and also optimized storage is disabled by default but you might want to go ahead and enable that on iOS 17.5. And then of course we do have some of the other minor changes like the font size for the weather widget right there, the text is smaller, and then also for the podcast, if we go to the podcast right here and we start playing that, you can see that the podcast will change to the dynamic color of the album artwork where in this situation, it's not actually the dynamic color. It's not, I guess white turns to this like grayish color there, but it does change to the more dominant color in the artwork for that podcast, which is great. And then as always, you guys know, I will bring you every other feature and change in my official what's new video for iOS 17.5, which is coming most likely on Monday. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I will cover everything in that video. Now, here's where things get very interesting because if we go into Geekbench, this really shocked me. So I ran a Geekbench test and take a look at these scores. Now, I was in airplane mode when I ran this. I never really had a huge discrepancy between airplane mode and not, so that could play a role here, but I scored a 2973 on the multi-core on the single core and a 7348 on the multi-core. I believe that is the highest single core score I've ever gotten on any iPhone ever. So if I go down here, 2973, you can see that nothing has touched 2973. I mean, you can see it's gotten close a few times, but nothing has touched it. So we got 2967 there. So 2973, I believe, is the highest I've ever gotten. And then also we had a 7348 on the multi-core. Huge difference from the day I installed 17.5. You can see right below that on May 7th, huge difference from when I just ran it today, especially in the multi-core versus after the initial install. So performance based on this alone, I would say is probably better than any previous beta. And so far to me and everybody I've seen in the comment section, performance is fine on 17.5 RC. It's really good. I should say not just fine. It's really good. So yeah, don't expect any type of major issues with performance here with the RC or the final release, especially based on those scores and then when it comes to the battery life battery life has absolutely been better ever since beta 3. so i talked about this in my beta 3 video and going from beta 3 to beta 4 to rc there's been a very minor difference it has gotten a little bit better but going from beta 2 to beta 3 was a huge jump for me on my device devices actually on 17.5 so i would expect battery life to be a little bit better than it was on 17.4 and 17.4.1 but uh yeah it's probably not going to be a major difference but if you did have any battery drain issues like i always say it's probably going to be resolved 
with 17.5. Really no complaints. I've really had very few people tell me about bad battery life in 17.5. Most of the people who say that are just people who have bad battery life on every single version. And it's usually a them problem, not the software. Anyways, let's talk about what to expect next. So next up, like I said, is going to be the final public release of iOS 17.5. That's going to roll out to everybody who is not on the beta program. So that's most likely coming on Monday, the 13th. So we should see 17.5, iPadOS 17.5, and most of the other software on Monday. We did see a late release for macOS uh, Sonoma, the latest version of that, the RC version. So that might come at a later date, but we are expecting iOS 17.5 on Monday. And then after that, we should see, of course, the new iPads are coming on Wednesday, the 15th. And then after that, we could see 17.6 beta one kick off as early as the next day on the 14th. If not, we will see that most likely the following week. And of course, that's all leading up to iOS 18 beta one, which is coming on June 10th. I cannot wait for that. Okay, so now let's move on to some more Apple news. And in case you were under a rock, Apple announced new iPads this week. And I want to briefly run through what Apple announced and my overall reaction and my take on these new iPads before they arrive in the studio. So first off, Apple launched a new iPad Air and iPad Pro on Tuesday during their Let Loose event. And the iPad Pro has the M4 chip, iPad Air has the M2. Both devices come in 11 inch and 13 inch sizes. So the iPad Pro was the specific product that really dominated the headlines this week. And that's for good reason. I mean, not only does it have the M4 chip, which is about 50% faster in terms of CPU and four times faster in terms of GPU over the M2, but it also has another first on an Apple product. And that is a tandem OLED display. It's basically two OLEDs squished together to make one amazing display. And that's on both 11 inch and 13 inch models. And and the new iPad Pro also has another first of its kind. It has a nano textured display, first of its kind for like a mobile device that was on you know previous devices like the displays, but not on an iPad. And the pricing is also right on these new iPads because the iPad Air starts at $599 and the iPad Pro starts at $999. So 256 gigs for the iPad Pro starting storage and 128 for the iPad Air. Now, in addition, we also saw a new Apple Pencil Pro. So this comes with Find My built-in, a new squeeze gesture, a gyroscope, and haptic feedback, all for 129 bucks, which is a great deal. And there's also multiple different styles for the packaging, which is pretty awesome that Apple did that. And then we also saw the launch of a new Magic Keyboard for the iPad Pro, which has an aluminum build. It has a new function row and a larger glass trackpad with haptic feedback. So honestly, it was a great event. And I think Apple nailed it with these iPads. I mean, I think they did pretty much everything that we were hoping for. You know, it's still an iPad at the end of the day. Like no matter what they do, there's still going to be a lot of people that complain because it's still an iPad. It's it's still limited by iPad OS. But nonetheless, I think Apple did a great job with the iPad Air and especially with the iPad Pro, especially with all the new technology and making that under $1,000, even if it's only $999. I just think that is a great deal. The iPad Pro in general with the M4 is a great deal if you want to future-proof yourself. Now, of course, all of these will be released on Wednesday and I will be doing extensive coverage here on the channel. So stay tuned for all of those videos. Now, if you are watching the event, if you were in my live stream watching the event when Apple showed off the ad for the new iPad Pro with that M4 chip, there was controversy from the start, but the controversy really picked up after the event and Tim Cook posted the ad, the video on X or Twitter, and the hate started pouring in on both X and on YouTube, just all of social media blew up. Everybody was really against Apple for this ad. And now it looks like Apple has apologized for this ad and they've scrapped the plans for it to roll out on TV. So Apple was banking on this ad, which I thought was great. I think that, you know, media is too soft these days. I don't think there was really anything wrong with squishing all those products, but nonetheless, you know, Apple had big plans to roll this ad out to TV networks. It was going to be a big TV campaign, but they've scrapped that now because everybody's so soft. But anyways, in an exclusive statement to ad age, Apple basically apologized for this crush ad. They said creativity is in our DNA at Apple, and it's incredibly important to us to design products that empower creatives all over the world. Our goal is to always celebrate the myriad of ways users express themselves and bring their ideas to life through iPad. We missed the mark with this video and we're sorry. So what we're witnessing here is a very rare misstep for Apple. Apple rarely ever 
has to publicly apologize for an advertisement they put out. And I know I said earlier how, you know, people are soft or whatever, you know, that's just my opinion. And, you know, I, I do see where people are coming from. I do see why people are upset at this. You know, I saw somebody tweet out there. There was like a, their kid came home from school and asked if Apple is going to crush their computer and, and all their products in their house because they saw that ad. I guess you don't know the way that, uh, you know, especially kids brains think with things like that. And even if you're just a normal adult, thinking like I can see how somebody would take this ad in a negative way. I mean, it's not, it's not typical Apple fashion. This ad is not. And, and I kind of see where, you know, people are upset. At. I don't get it. You know, it doesn't offend me. It doesn't make me upset, but I see where people are coming from. So I think it's probably a good idea that Apple takes this down. And then finally, just as tradition here on the channel, let's talk about another crazy air tag story. So this time a woman in Wisconsin discovered an unknown air tag hidden under the trunk of a vehicle that was being driven by her boyfriend. It was still clean, so it appeared to have been recently placed there. Then, days later, the woman discovered an unknown air tag on her car, and that's when she decided to call the police. And once they arrived, they got the last four digits of the owner's phone number and were able to link it back to the man's ex-girlfriend, of which the current girlfriend had an active restraining order against. So this does not seem like it was the first incident between these two. So she apparently used an old phone number to monitor the location through the air tags the ex-girlfriend did. And of course, when the ex-girlfriend got confronted, she denied the allegations at first, but eventually confessed to placing the air tags on both vehicles and did it to, quote, place herself at the same place as her ex-boyfriend and thereby make the woman mad, the new girlfriend mad. Well, I sure hope that making the new girlfriend mad was worth two counts of misuse of a GPS device, two counts of violation of an injunction, and also a $500 cash bond. I really hope that was worth it for you. So yeah, just another crazy air tag story and not the first or last time we will hear about a crazy ex stalking their old boyfriend or girlfriend. So stay vigilant out there if you find an air tag on you or if you get the alert unknown tracking you know nearby take it seriously call the police and get it figured out but anyways guys there you have it that is the latest in the world of apple stay tuned for ios 17.5 and the new ipads next week i'll see you soon